Today I will be speaking on three aspects. One is acute coronary syndrome, that is the heart attack. The next should be rare case studies. So I will be beginning my talk with the management of acute coronary syndrome, that is heart attacks. From the time the patient develops heart attack to the treatment given, whether in the form of a medical therapy or a form of intervention therapy. Intervention therapy in the form of primary angioplasty. So the content of my talk would be, what is acute coronary syndrome, pathogenesis, management of issues and summary. I will not be touching the risk factors and all, which will consume a lot of time. When you talk about acute coronary syndrome, there are three spectrums, that is unstable angina, and ST revision MI, ST revision MI. These are all characterized by a common pathophysiology of disrupted atherosclerotic plaque. We have been seeing from our, our medical days how the atherosclerotic plaque progresses. An LDL, that is low density lipoprotein, that gets internalized into the inter, uh, elastic lamina, followed by that, there will be oxidization of the LDL particles, which will be imbibed by the macrophages. Then they become foam cells with the liberation of various interleukins. There will be further proliferation of the inflammatory tissue, internalization of the smooth muscle cells. Ultimately, there will be formation of a atherosclerotic plaque. Once there is a formation of an atherosclerotic plaque, the atherosclerotic plaque can be soft, that is called as unstable plaque, or the surface can be calcified, that is called as a stable plaque. So, this is the coronary lumen, where there will be slowly formation of the atherosclerotic plaque, followed by disruption of its surface, followed by leading to formation of clot and subsequently occlusion of the coronary blood vessels. Once there is an occlusion of the coronary blood vessels, the muscle which is supplied with this will get compromised of its blood supply. So the patient will develop acute coronary syndrome, that is acute heart attack. So this is a demonstration in which the atherosclerotic plaque with an unstable plaque ruptures. Followed with that, there will be activation of the corporation cascade leading to occlusion of the coronary vessel. So when treating myocardial infarction, we tell time is the muscle. So as soon as the patient develops heart attack, we have to identify that time and has to be subjected for necessary treatment at the earliest. So the earliest we take the precautions and in revascular the patient, there will be so much of benefit in preventing the myocardium. Whenever the patient develops heart attack, when 8% of the myocardium is lost, there will be diastolic dysfunction. 15 to 20% of the myocardium is lost, there will be systolic dysfunction. 25% lost, there will be pulmonary edema. And more than 40% of the myocardium is lost, patient will develop cardiogenic shock. Then how do you diagnose? The typical symptoms, the ECG presentation, and serum biomarkers followed by imaging, that is in the form of echocardiography. Here we can see there is a here you can see there are gross ST depression in the electrocardiogram. So when we are talking about acute coronary syndrome, there can be ST elevation MI, NST elevation MI, unstable angina, which I have already elevated. So these are the Typical exit changes of a patient with enteroval MI where there is a gross ST elevation. The ST should be of this level, but in this case there is a gross ST elevation and there is reciprocal depression of the ECG ST segment in the inferior reads. So this is one of the patient, other patient with gross ST elevation. This is an anterior wall MI. So the difference between unstable angina and ST elevation MI and ST elevation MI is in unstable angina there will be action enzymes. In ST elevation MI, there will be presence of the enzymes, positive enzymes. In ST elevation, in NST elevation MI, and ST elevation MI, there will be gross ST elevation. So, with the evolution of this treatment and evolution of the diagnostic studies, patient coming, like, there has been a classification called as Kelly's classification in 1967. Based on that classification, there is, that tells about the mortality. So, the patient who are presenting with Kelly's class 4 still has got nearly 60 to 70 percent of the mortality even with the advent of the somatic science. 
So management of acute coronary syndrome. When a patient comes with acute coronary syndrome with the classical symptoms, cystic changes, acute chest pain, enzyme positive, and regional wall motion abnormality in the echocardiogram. So this is the flowchart how we should approach. A patient coming with a stable vision MI. Candidate for reperfusion. Initially seen at a PCI capable hospital, send it to Katha for primary PCI, which has to be done within 90 minutes, so less than 90 minutes. Then you get a diagnostic angiogram, then perform the percutaneous coronary intervention. So if the patient is not seen at a cathode facility hospital, we should anticipate the time from the point of first medical contact to the time where the patient can be shifted to the cathode facility hospital. If that is less than 120 minutes, then there should not be waste in time. The such patients has to be treated with antiplatelets such as streptokinase selectivase. So the indications of uh, study, so whenever there is a heart attack, the time comes. So we should choose the fastest modality of the transport. When you talk about coronary angioplasty, the angioplasty which is done after a heart attack, in the circumstances of the heart attack is called as the primary angioplasty. If it is done on a routine basis, that is called as an elective angioplasty. So before going to, like how an angioplasty is done? Basically, we place the stent in the uploaded blood vessel. What we do, we choose either radial methodology or the fibrillar methodology, wherein we look the coronary arteries and pass a guide wire across the blocked coronary vessel. I will be showing some of the pictures. Then we inflate the stent. We inflate, we take the balloon mounted stent and inflate the balloon so that stent stuck to the coronary vessel. We deflate the balloon and get the balloon back. So this is the, to know the anatomy, I just copied some of the angiograms. So we see the angiograms in different angles so that can, we should not miss the anatomy. So we are seeing the normal angiogram, normal blood vessels in these angiograms. This is the right coronary artery angiogram. So as I told, we will be proceeding from the femoral then going through the iota, we will be hooking to the coronaries through the this guide, uh, guide catheter, we pass the coronary wire, then that coronary wire goes like this. So we got a balloon mounted stent, when the balloon gets inflated, the stent will be deployed, then we deflate the balloon and get the whole system back, leaving the stent in situ, so that the approved coronary vessel will be opened and the flow will be achieved. In this patient you can see there is a blockage here. Different angle. Here you can see that this is a total cutoff of the left anterior descending artery. This is a, again different view. So now what I did? I just passed the so I just passed the wire across this vessel and as well as this vessel. So this is a stent. This is a balloon mounted stent. And this diagrams are shown in different angles. So after deploying the stent, there is a clear flow into the so after deploying the stent, there is a clear flow into the left anterior descending artery, which is flowing very well. So this is how an angioplasty is performed. So this is the gold standard treatment for any patient who is having a heart attack. So in different angle. The vessel which I blocked here has completely opened and flows to the end. It's a comparison here. The blood vessel is completely open, which is occluded at its mid part. So this is the same like what we did. We just took the uh, catheter, hooked to the coronaries. Through that, I took the balloon mounted stent, deployed the stent, I deflated the balloon, got the whole system back, leaving the stent in situ. So these are the different kinds of stents. So these are the metal objects with the different drug coatings which will be placed in the coronary system. So this is the prior to the treatment. I Here, there is a total cutoff in the mid part with so much of the thrombus filled the 
in the coronaries. Right? This is after deploying the strength, the whole of the vessel is opened. So this has been done within three to four hours of having the first heart attack, the, like occlusion of the blood vessels. So if you are able to achieve this as, as early as possible, then whole of the myocardium will be preserved. There will be not much damage. So that's why the indication for primary angioplasty is class one. So antiparietal therapy and all, uh, which is beyond the scope of this class. When we are having it, uh, patient is having a heart attack, the loading doses has to be given ecosparin 160 to 325 milligrams. Then the other loading doses are pico vital receptor inhibitors, that is antiparietal drugs like crocodile, prasugal, and ticagrelar. So when giving ticagrelar, you should make sure that the ecosparin dosage should be less than it should be 85 milligrams only. Unlike in other patients where we give the ecosparin at a dose of 150 milligrams. Prasugal should not be administered to patients with history of uh, prior stroke or transient ischemic attacks. Then there are certain things, anticoagulants like uh, uh, heparin and oxyparin and bivaritin has to be administered so that the strength which has been placed will not be blocked. So if the patient is, if there is no facility for cat life, then the patient has to be lies with some of the medications like streptokinase, teneteplase, alteplase, retoplase. So these will break down the clot and achieve the flow at that point of time. Subsequently, like if you are not able to take the patient to a cath lab for an angiography, angiography, then patient has to be given these lytic drugs. The lytic drugs are streptokinase, teneteplase, retoplase, and alteplase. These act by breaking down the clot and achieving the flow. We call it as three flows. So the best drug amongst all this will be tenetoplase, but the because of cost term constraints in India, we use streptokinase to the poor patients. So these are the that is this. So we are using tenetoplase, retoplase, alteplase, streptokinase. Before giving these drugs, before giving these lytic drugs, we need to look out for the contraindications. There were, was there any previous history of intercal hemorrhage, no structural cerebral vascular regions, no malignant intercal neoplasm, ischemic stroke within the past three months, suspected act dissection, active bleeding or diathesis, and significant close trauma within the last three months. So these are the contraindications one need to observe when you are giving this anti uh, light drugs. So the next would be uh, apart from this, uh, like when has to be given? So this uh, streptokinase, alteplase, cetaplase, these lytic drugs should be given. They have got the greatest benefit with the previous 24 hours of MI, or if there is an ongoing pain, still we can consider between 20 to 24 hours. So the best beneficial effect of these lytic agents will be the patient has got heart attack, and within 12 hours of heart attack, these have got the best benefits. So these drugs, these patients who are rising should also be given to those very important as per the guidelines which I have already shown. Then there are also infection uh, heparin and oxyparin and frontoparin should be administered at least 48 hours to 8 days for these patients in order not to cause the re-block in the coronary system. Then such patients, if there is an anatomy, if you do an angiogram to such patients, and if the anatomy is not suitable, that, that patient has to be subjected for CABG, that is coronary artery bypass grafting. But in, in order to that, we need to know whether the, these patients are on drugs, like there is no contraindication and when we are giving cosparin. But if we are giving clopidogrel, patient has to wait at least a day before these patients are taken up for coronary artery bypass grafting, that is open heart surgery. So we have got the beta blockers which have got high mortality benefits. It has to be given to all the patients uh, without noting the contraindication should be started within 24 hours of the acute heart attacks. Then they have got DC inhibitors, they have got a mortality benefit. Patient with anterior location MI, heart failure, ejection fraction less than 40% has to be given these drugs. Lipid management, the goal has to be keep the NDA levels less than 70 millimeters of millimoles. Then aspiration thrombectomy. These days, this is this is losing its role. In all of the uh, like aspiration thrombectomy, this is a technique where the thrombus spread coronary artery. We will go there and aspirate the clot, aspirate the clot, and try to achieve the flow. I will show one of the example. So this is an aspiration clot where this catheter will be progressed into the coronary vessel. Then we give an acute deflation pressure. It sucks the clot. This is one of my patient wherein this artery is completely occluded. 
So here it is completely occluded. Here it is completely occluded. Then okay, that's a why. Then I use an aspiration catheter and set the whole of the cord. This black tip is the aspiration catheter. So after that, there is a complete flow. Complete flow. So just go back to my slides. After using such a catheter in my patient where there is complete occlusion here. So after using this aspiration technology, so I was able to achieve complete blood flow. This is like in the new life to such patients. Though I this was a got extracted from the coronaries, which has got, caused this massive heart attack. So this is the flow chart which we need to see. Right? Whenever the patient has got a heart attack, whenever there is an occlusion of the blood vessel of the heart, we need to take all the measures to open that blood vessels, either in the form of a primary angioplasty, wherein we are going and putting a strength and opening the blood vessel. Or if there is no facility with the cath lab, then we need to lyse this patient with either streptokinase, tenecteplase, reteplase or alteplase. Then subsequently this patient has to be subjected for an angiogram for further revascularization. There are some new modifications to this one which is beyond the scope of this class. So whenever the patient has got a heart attack, our aim is to give the loading dosage, shift to a hospital. If it is capable of an angiogram angioplasty, then patient has to be subjected for a primary angioplasty. That is putting a strength across the blocked vessel. If there is no facility for cat lab, then the patient has to be lies with the right occasion which I have already allotted. So in order the myocardium will be preserved. So in treating myocardial infarction, we all should know that time is muscle. So as we go on delaying, there will be loss of much of the cells of the myocardium. So we have to take all measures in order to prevent the myocardial death. So time is life in preserving the myocardium. Thank you. Uh, I got two also other interesting cases which I will just discuss. That is a rare case of aorta pulmonary window. Five months baby, patient presented to, to me with cough with on and off fever. There is profuse sweating. On auscultation, second heart sound was loud, loud for you. Such patients, when we are doing echocardiography, the saturation at room A temperature has to be checked. The saturation of this baby was 96%, ruling out any possible TFN, cyanotic and heart disease. This baby was referred to me for cardiac evaluation. So when we are doing cardiac evaluation, when we are doing an echocardiography or other forms of investigation to such patients, we need to know this preamble. Every pediatrician, cardiologist or other health care provider must try to get a complete diagnosis on a child suspected of, suspected of having heart disease even if that requires referral to a higher center. So we should always make because if such patients are not diagnosed on time, if the babies are not diagnosed on time, we will, if we miss the diagnosis then we will just reach a stage of irreparable stage. So the diagnosis of such patients is very very crucial and important. The child was crying generally when we do an echocardiography on a small baby and all. If they cry in door, we will not get an adequate window. So, we need to make sure that the child is calm. If required, the child has to be sedated. So, crying in a irritable child, heart appears structurally normal. There was moderate right respiratory registration. On color doctor, uh, on continuous doctor, there was severe pulmonary artery hypertension with EA pressures of 105 millimeters of mercury. Generally, we just look out for the common congenital heart diseases like atrial separate defect ventricular separate defect, patent ductus arteriosus and AV canal defect. Such things were not found. Next diagnosis usually considered is persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn. So when a patient presenting with such clinical findings on echocardiography, if you are able to find out such a high pressures, then if there are no common identifiable things, then we tell this patient as persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborns because of the involution of the lungs, because of the poor expansion of the lungs because the status of the fetus which is persisting in the future life that we call it as a persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn so if the child if you are not able to find out the cause for pulmonary hypertension then we depict these patients as either idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn so this is a slide showing 
severe hypertension. So generally, if you find out so much of PA pressures, then we tell it is end of the life. We can't do anything. So in this patient, I was so curious to know why this thing is happening. So there is a, something called a short axis V. Short axis V in the echocardiography, there I found a small defect, the defect between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So here, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the aorta, there is a clear cut defect which is communicating between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So in general, children with shank lesions less than age 2 years are operable, including those with severe pulmonary hypertension. This is the AIMS classification what we follow. So this is the defect between the, this is the pulmonary artery and this is the aorta. There is a classical defect between the aorta and the pulmonary artery called as aorta pulmonary window. So this is so much of gap. This is the pulmonary artery, this is aorta. There is so much of gap between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So there are three types of that. So this is the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery. One type only that is communication here. Type two is a communication here. Type three, the pulmonary nerve, right pulmonary artery arises from the aorta. So pathophysiology is a large non-restricted communi communication exists between the proximal ascending aorta and the main pulmonary artery, resulting in high flow arterial level left to right check. This leads to pulmonary over circulation and rapidly progressive congestive heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. So this patient, because we could be we able to identify this on time, this patient underwent batch closure. So there was a this defect, the defect which was present here was closed with it. This defect was closed with a pericardial patch. So there is a comparative study. So this is the this was the defect that was closed with a patch. Now on follow up study. The patient is absolutely fine and doing well. So this is the pre-surgery echocardiography where there is a gross defect and this is the post-surgery echocardiography that is a patch is closed. So uh, invariably with this you are able to achieve. I have one more case, similar case where the defect, this is a small defect. This is also recently identified by me. So this is very, very, very rare cases. I have to compare windows of very rare cases which are found in 1% of the total congenital cardiac diseases. So I was I was able to diagnose these two cases in my last two years. The previous cases what I seen were both as in my So identifying such patients, uh, it is just like giving a new life to these babies. So by this we know what are the causes of cyanotic congenital heart disease we have discussed. When will these eyes and rise? We should know that. Role of clinical suspicion and at most caution to be taken with all possible diagnosis while doing an echo. So, the message here is cardiology has evolved drastically from various things. You know, they, these days we are doing trans aortic, uh, trans catheter aortic wall replacements, then uh, LVADs, left ventricular assist devices, then CRTD, but uh, mitral clips, but appropriate use of diagnostic tools, high clinical suspicion of rate disorders will give the same satisfaction and result in par with these procedures that are highly avoid, complicated, skilled and costly. So the important thing is that these are these patients can be saved and can give normal life. But thing is that we need to diagnose this patient at the earliest. Diagnosing this aortic window is a very very difficult task. Majority of the patients will be best undiagnosed will be termed as primary pulmonary hypertension or idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and they die. The two cases what I have seen while I was learning in an institution, both I saw isometrized cases. That means they were not operable. These two cases, and because of the grace of the God, they were able to diagnose at the earliest and both the cases got operated and they are, they are doing extremely good. Thank you. So this is an x ray patient. If you are good in reading the X-ray, here you can see Normally we tell this X-ray has got a CO2 changes plus there is a pneumonia in the right mid zone of the lung and a tubular type of heart. So 65 main patient, no case of carcinoma of esophagus, treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy 18 months prior. Patient had difficulty in swallowing, underwent palliative 
underwent palliative insufficient stenting six months prior. This patient presented with breathlessness, functional class 4. Then routine echo was asked. In this routine echo, there is here you can see this we call it as a spontaneous echo contrast. There are bubbles. There are bubbles in the echocardiograph. This is the interface between the pericardium and the myocardium. So this is the black colored fluid thing is called as the pericardial effusion and that is spontaneous echo contrast. The bubble like things are called as spontaneous echo contrast which is not, not seen, which will not be possible until or unless we put some air into the pericardium. So where the air has come from? This is another black and white picture. This is the other view. Here you can see a buckle of the myocardium. So probably there is a fistula across that place. So this, is, this was the stenting of the same patient's esophagus, wherein a stent was put in the esophagus because the esophagus was obstructed because of carcinoma. I. This was done for a palliative procedure. So here, in the, here you can see this is the esophagus and this is the myocardium. So the probable place of inter I mean uh, fistula could be at the posterior part of the atrium. So we got a CT scan there. CT scan we typically see there is an air fluid level, air fluid level in the pericardium, which is very very rare. Which is this is not possible until and unless we in, uh, we put in air. From where the air should come, there are very very few causes such as esophageal carcinoma where there can be erosion of the carcinoma into the pericardium, wherein when we take air, air, air things, air, tricky and so because that air will go into the pericardium. The other is while performing it, ablation therapy for the right, left atrium by treating the atrium patients. So here we can see classic air fluid level which is very very rare which has been documented in this patient. So here we can see air fluid level, this is a dark thing as a air, this is a fluid level and this is the stent which was there in the esophagus. That is the air fluid level air in the pericardium, and this is the strength. Such a similar case was also published, almost similar case has been published in one of the journal, but in that patient, you can't see that mnemonic patch here. In that my patient, there is a mnemonic patch. And here they have marked the arrow of air. You know, I come back to my x ray. We didn't observe this, so this is the air. This can be missed routinely as an artifact when you take an x ray. But actually, this is an air which is present in the pericardium. So this has to be carefully looked into. That is the air travel. This is the very rare case of pericardial insufficient fistula, has got very high mortality, needs immediate surgery to close the fistula. Patient succumbed, in the preparation for surgery, patient succumbed because of the multiple organ dysfunction. So, this is one of the rare cases. Spontaneous echo contrast in the pericardium is an important finding. This patient has got a very high mortality. Trauma, EP studies with the LA operation, malignancies are the important causes for this piece of pericardial fistula. Thank you.